So we're here in California with another farm tour and Brent is gonna tell us a little bit about his dairy operation here. How's it going? Welcome to Hillmar, California. Um, this farm's called Wickstrom Jersey Farms. Started in 1973 by my grandfather, Dwayne. Uh, we milk 2,400 head on this dairy on a 60 stall rotary. Um, we also have two other farms, one with two 72 stall rotaries milking 5,600 and another one with a 36 stall parallel. We milk uh, 1,200 there. Uh, we farm about 2,500 acres between the three operations um, to supply wheat and corn silage to our cows. Well, those are some pretty impressive numbers. Yeah, we're not currently milking. We can kind of walk around and look at the free stalls and other facilities and hopefully get back by the time the night shift shows up to start milking. Awesome. This is one of our uh, milk strings. Each pin holds about 330 cows across the dairy. Um, try to keep mature cows separated from first and second lactation sometimes as much as we can. Um, everything has headlocks, everything's fed two or three times a day depending on stage of lactation. Everything's milked three times a day, except for fresh cows are four times a day. Um, like we explained, flush comes through three times a day to clean the lanes. Um, we clean the feed out three times a week and uh, push feed about every hour and a half in these strings, uh, the ones going to the milk barn. So we have a 60 stall rotary that can do about 400 cows an hour. So each pin takes about 45, 50 minutes to milk, uh, all 330 cows. We're actually a little crowded. Every, every pin has like 350 right now. So it takes a little longer, but it's kind of what we shoot for, 45 minutes out of the barn for milking. Awesome. And this is what we like to see <laughs> right there. Taking over the US. <laughs> as I'm wearing a American hat. <laughs> Perfect. So how long is this freestall barn? Uh, this one's about 800 feet because it has uh, a couple of fresh pins at the top end that have 90 cows each for, those are the ones that get milked four times a day for about two to three weeks, depending on how heavy we're calving. Wow. Uh, yeah, most barns are about 650 feet long. So we call this the special needs or maternity barn. Um, the freestall side is all dry cows and far off springers. And then when they're about 260 days uh, carry calf, they move to the bedded pack side. So we have all the mature cows and then all the springers on this side. Uh, everything calves in there. And then twice a day, we use this flat barn to milk colostrum uh, and process the fresh cows, whatever they need, uh, before they get kicked out to the fresh bin on the main milking part of the dairy. And then we house newborn calves overnight. Uh, calves get shipped out every morning. About half the herd is bred to beef sires, and the other half is bred to sex female semen to make up our replacements. Um, so they get housed here and shipped out daily, and then we have all our colostrum processings in here, pasteurizer and thaw bath. So you can see our colostrum bags that uh, Rita just finished pasteurizing and bagged, and those are gonna get frozen and used uh, as calves are being born every day. This is the colostrum pasteurizer, so twice a day after all the, whatever fresh cows with calved in the last 12 hours get melted, the whole batch gets mixed and pasteurized, and then uh, sample for quality and uh, IgG levels uh, before putting being put in bags and frozen. And then as cows are born, we use this thaw bath uh, to heat it up to drinking temperature and thaw out evenly as cows are born. We used to just use the hot water heater, then you burn the outside of the colostrum bag. So this is a lot, I think it's at 720 degrees. So it's just at the right temperature for the cows that are born. So every barn's flush, every lane's flush three times a day with recycled manure water. We'll walk by the processing pit. So everything everything drains there, gets mixed and pumped out of there for flush. And once it gets to a certain level, it gets pumped over the screen separators and takes the solids out. Mm -hmm. And then all the milk barn fresh water kind of thins that out throughout the day. So it's not just getting diluted down with manure solids. And how many times a day would this alley be flushed? Every alley is three times a day. Mm -hmm. So we try to do it every, all the cows are milked 3X. We try to do it, you know, within an hour before they go to the barn, every milking as close as we can. Sweet. Yeah, you can see that liquid flowing through. And that's gonna go to the end of the barn and that's what cleans the alleys out.
These shouldn't be running this time of year, but our soakers are going because we're a little too warm in California right now. Um, but these are all on timers and temperature control, so the hotter it gets, the more often they run, uh, usually on for about 30 seconds at a time. And then they pair with our freestyle fans to get the evaporative cooling we want on the cows throughout the summertime. Awesome. See, so yeah, I can see right behind the feed rail there. Yeah. Get a spray and water. Yeah, you want it to drench right around their bellies, get them nice and soaked, and then shut off and let them blow through with the fans after that. Yeah, so this is right at the back of the dairy. You can see the processing pit uh, where I was saying where all the separate, all the flush manure ends up and gets pumped back out. Um, so you can see the lanes behind us where the flush goes down to the end of the barn and then comes an underground pipeline back to the processing pit where it gets blended with agitators um, and either pumped over the separating screens or from the pump back out to the next flush lane to clean the next pin. And that cycle just repeats three times a day and keeps getting more water added to it to keep it thin. Awesome. And that would be water that was used for the wash cycle in the parlor? Yep. Yes, yeah, so we recycle all the water from the parlor, parlor and all the soaker lines all drain to this area and that all ends up either back on the flush lanes or into our holding pits behind us and that gets used for crop irrigation for nutrient management and uh, all that throughout the year. Awesome. So you're constantly recycling every bit of water that you use and at the end of that entire process, you guys are building, are in the process right now of building a digester, correct? Yeah, we're uh, hopefully this summer installing a methane digester um, and all that will be pumped about 20 miles north uh, and used to burn ethanol to go back into the power grid. Um, so I've always heard the stat, every gallon of water on a dairy gets used seven times. I'm not sure how to prove that on a dairy, but you can see the water just keeps going in circles and then either ends up as fertilizer or back being uh, in the barns that clean the cows. So yeah, pretty exciting that we can just keep that water in a cycle and keep reusing it as much as we can. Cool to see. So another project we have going right now, this whole field is gonna be um, a solar array. Hopefully this April or May will be installed um, and it'll be tied directly into our milk barn and our uh, separation system in the back to offset all that power usage. So a lot of renewable energy and stuff going on in California, I guess. Yeah. Electric mixers and methane digesters and solar panels. Bunch of hipsters, man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I need to grow my hair out. Yeah. <laughs> so this is our commodity area. Um, we make all our own premixes on farm except for our milk cow mineral. So you can see the several premix bays and then all the ingredients in between from cotton seed, rolled corn, ground corn, uh, almond holes, which are pretty prevalent here in California. Um, mostly all agriculture by, uh, byproducts. You know, the outside of the almond nut that you're used to eating uh, to the cotton seed pit uh, after they pull the cotton off for clothing, bakery waste, soybean meal, all that, all that kind of stuff goes into our premixes. Nutritionist formulates our rations and we make about five premixes a day, store those all in these open bays and use those to feed the cows every day. We also mix in uh, water and molasses in the mixing area when the wagon's in there. And we're also in the pro process of putting in two electric stationaries to cut our diesel usage in the next uh, hopefully six months. Have that installed and uh, just be a little bit more efficient with all the regulations we're dealing with in California. So you say you have a pit, is that what's right there? Yeah, it's just our wagon's so tall we drive the tractor in there so that the loader can have an easier time reaching it instead of being jacked up as high as it can all day long. So this is where you park it and fill the wagon actually? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. That's cool. And then it's got all the water and molasses hookups right over the wagon so it doesn't have to move after he loads the dry ingredients in. He opens the valve and puts all the wet ingredients in right on top of it while it's finishing its mix. That's cool. You can also see around it, we keep try to keep our silages as close as we can to be efficient with the loading process. We got our corn silage right here. Um, and just on the back side of the commodity barn, we have our wheat silage pile. Um, and then on the far end, the, the next corn silage pile will go to uh, later this summer. Wow. Yeah, it's just a high energy source for the cows. So if you pick a cotton ball off the plant, it'll just be the center of that. It's the pit right in the middle of it. Yeah, that's one thing we notice. Everyone's pretty proud about feeding the byproducts that would otherwise go to waste out here. Yeah. Because there's so many different crops grown out here in this valley and stuff like this can be fed to cows to make milk. Yeah, a lot of dairies farther south than here that are closer to the uh, citrus producers, they feed just cold citrus that didn't quite make grade to be sold to the consumers. They'll feed just a pile of oranges to their cows or I've seen other dairies feed candy waste, so just Snickers bars in a pile and cows really like those products, but we don't get those in our area. That's interesting. So this is the, the whole almond product. So the part you're used to eating is the nut, which is inside the shell. 
So the shell is kind of the hard interior coating of the nut. There's no nut in this one. So that'd be the shell. And we use this byproduct for bedding the cows in our compost barns and bedded packs. And then on the outside of that is what's called the hole. And this is a high protein feed that we feed the cows. It's more soft and you can actually chew it. It's almost like beef jerky consistency. So all three parts of the almond get used either for humans, cows, or bedding. So this is our, we've been uh, practicing with some triple cropping here in California. This is our uh, crop this year, sorghum silage, um, taken immaturely to feed the milk cows to stretch our corn silage inventories. We also do uh, our wheat silage in the springtime. We take a good portion of that in the boot stage to be more digestible for milk cows as well. So kind of <coughs> sorghum in the fall and winter, uh, boot wheat in the spring and summer, along with our corn silage of the milking strings. What would you compare sorghum silage to? Like I've never seen this stuff before. Is it kind of like barley or alfalfa or no, corn? No, it's, it's more similar to like a wheat. It okay. almost looks like wheat in the field. Yeah, oh, yeah. it's just a different variety. Grows, grows better in the late fall. Right on. This is our first string in the barn for the afternoon milking. Uh, we milk two shifts, uh, 4 a.m. and 4 p.m. they start. Everything's milk 3x, we just do it with two sets of employees. Uh, usually three guys on, one guy prepping and attaching, and then one guy on the backside roaming or getting the next string of cows in. Uh, we have pre and post dip sprayer robots on this rotary. So we kind of eliminated that guy having to be there at the backside of the rotary all day. Uh, when he's in the barn, he's kind of helping make sure machines stay on. Otherwise he's out pulling cows in or helping these guys out when they get behind. Cool. Uh, this farm was built in 2009. Yeah, it's so about 13 years old now. Yeah, it's a 60 stall. Um, it was an upgrade. It's called a Magnum to get these automatic takeoffs to pull the machines down to go through the bridge on the backside. Oh, yeah. Uh, it, we figured it'd be helpful for the milkers. Instead of having to pick claws up every cow, these machines kind of raise the claw to the milker. You can see. And it also sets where the milker's allowed to put the machine on. We don't want them putting it on too soon, so it waits till we can set the stall. And once it gets there, the machine will come up to the milker. And you'll see, once it starts spinning, you'll see right here, it'll bring that machine up to the milker to attach. Most strings are running at about seven to eight seconds of stall. This one's a little slower just because the fresh cows were first lactation, so kind of training them on the rotary. Give them a little more time. You can see T1s we put in about, oh, about six months ago. Um, iodine pre and post dip. That seems to be a pretty popular option on rotary parlors. Yeah, yeah, especially recently with California overtime laws kicking in down to eight hours. So before that, we had another employee right here. We also have uh, RFID and milk meters in this barn, so you can see the cow IDs on every stall as they come through the entrance. Do you feed the cows grain on the rotary then, or? No, no feed in the parlor anymore. Yeah, okay. we haven't had that for about 20 years, I think. Um, kind of when the TMR came out in the late 80s, uh, started mixing our feed TMR in the big wagons and delivering out to the uh, main corrals. Okay. Well, that always surprises me to see the cows that really want to get onto that rotary, even though there's no feed on there. I guess they enjoy the ride. Yeah, they, just, they love getting on this thing. When we built it, it took about four or five days of just fighting cows, pushing them on. Uh, and then after that, you can see, these are fresh cows, they're not quite as eager, but the older cows, they almost fight to get on this thing. They'll be button heads, push each other into the rotary. Yeah, pretty cool to see. Yeah. And we can go down in the middle and you'll see cows, by the time they get onto the milk machine, they're chewing their cud and hanging out, enjoying the ride. Awesome. Yeah, you can see we actually have to put a big fire hose on to get the cows to get off the barn. Otherwise, they'll just keep going in circles. Yeah. 
probably like getting a little wet too when it's yeah, so warm here. Yeah, summertime, yeah. So you can see the cows get in here, and when we're on the outside, the machines go on about here, and you can see it down in the milk meters. Um, so all the milk comes down, goes through the milk meters, and they fill up, and that's how they calculate the milk. And from there, they all go to these uh, receiving tanks where the milk pumps are, and that gets pumped through all this stainless pipe over the top into the milk room through the plate cooler uh, and into the storage tanks. So everything kind of goes to the center of the barn. All the air comes from there, all the vacuum. Uh, the vacuum actually comes from through the uh, alleyway here. Everything else comes from the top. Yeah, it's always mind-boggling to think about how all that is going through this little center of the rotary to get to the, to the tanks at the end of the day. This is where all the milk comes from overhead into the receiving tank through the filter and uh, plate cooler and then into one of the two. Uh, 7,500 gallon storage tanks. And we ship about three of these tanks a day on average. So we need a little more space, but as long as the trucks show up, we stay ahead of the game. So yeah, like I said earlier, uh, the dairy is called Wickstrom Jersey Farms. We, my grandpa built this dairy in 1973. Uh, he started in 1969 on his own on a rental place down the road and then bought this and built his own facility. Um, so now it's my dad and my uncle and uh, me also on the farm running the day-to-day -day stuff. Um, between the three, we kind of all split our shares up and take care of everything that needs to be done. So uh, it's been rewarding working with family all these years. And coming, I came back from college in 2013 and kind of started taking over all the day-to-day -day stuff and managing the employees and all the stuff that goes on. So starting to send the old guys on vacation a little bit more these days when they want to leave. Um, so yeah, been here a while and always been jerseys too. Right on. And uh, you said you guys have a Facebook page? Yeah, we do. Uh, it's just Wickstrom Jersey Farms on Facebook. Uh, awesome. Kind of use that to advertise some of our genomic stuff and farm history and stuff like that. Trying to help the industry out as much as we can. So check it out if you want to. Yep, that'll be linked at the bottom of this video. So uh, I guess that's gonna be it for this video. And uh, thank you guys for watching and I hope to see you guys in the next one.